So uh, yeah, so we just uh, had uh, Stephen from Rigetti explain the software stack behind you know the forest ecosystem, and today I'll present uh, a bunch of algorithms uh, in quantum deep learning, the, the nascent field of quantum deep learning that we discovered uh, using their uh, software ecosystem for experimentation. Um, so. Okay, so it's on archive if you want to check it out. It's pretty recent, and it's with uh, Jason and Michael, some of which, some of my co-authors are in the, the room. All right, so hopefully you're slightly familiar with classical deep learning. You've probably heard of AI and, I mean, Skynet and all that stuff. No, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, hype in the, in the general media about classical deep learning, right? There's DeepMind and all sorts of companies doing some impressive stuff. And you know, the successes of classical deep learning uh, came from you know, deep theory work in like the 80s. So in a sense, you know, for the theory of quantum deep learning, we're in the 80s going 90s very soon because it's moving very, very, very fast. Uh, but uh, this paper is in a sense an attempt to unify uh, all the efforts uh, that have uh, been done so far under like one formalism and, and so on. So, so uh, Stephen mentioned uh, variational algorithms, and uh, those are kind of circuits where each, you parameterize a bunch of unitaries. Each unitary is parameterized by, you know, it could be an exponential of a poly, like e to the i, you know, something like e to the i theta x hat, you know, like a an exponential of a poly, and that's a parametric unitary. There's all sorts of possible choices of parametric unitaries, but that's what we mean by quantum parametric circuit. It's a circuit that's composed of a bunch of unitaries that are parametrized by a real number, right? And these have been the algorithms that people have been running in the near-term era of quantum computing, but coincidentally, they're very similar to classical deep learning. So, so in classical deep learning, you have an input you know, x, it's a vector, and then you have a bunch of little transformation. Uh, so like uh, a neuron usually takes in a bunch, a bunch of contributions from neurons in a previous layer. It applies an affine transformation, which is, you know, a linear combination and a shift, uh, and then it applies a squashing function, which is a nonlinear function. But in general, you're always applying the same kind of class of elementary function uh, at each uh, node in this graph. And you know the you have a, a flow of computation forward, and that's represented by the structure of the deep neural network. So this is what we call a feed-forward neural network. You give an input, you apply all these parameterized tiny transformations, and you know you apply many many layers of them, and many um, many of them, and ultimately you get an output that depends on your input, and also depends on your choice of parameters. So here, phi is a vector of real numbers. Right? So we have our parameters phi, our input x, our feed forward operation would be, I don't know, something like f. And then we have some metric to benchmark how well our output is doing and where, what it should be. Right? So in general, if we're doing classification or, or supervised learning here, we'd have a desired output for a given input. Let's say it's y. Then you know, my loss function it, or error function is going to quantify how well my current output did for the given input, right? So that would be for a single data point. So in general, I'd have a loss function of my output for the given data point and the parameters and the uh, desired uh, output. And this is a real number that we'll want to minimize. Our goal is to minimize the error, right? It could be like a distance of, you know, uh, this, this could be like uh, cat or dog, you know, it could be a binary uh, label and, you know, I, I want this picture to be more cat than dog and then I, I, I give you uh, a certain penalty depending on that. But the goal is that we're going to try to figure out optimization strategies to minimize this loss function. And here I only have a single data point, but in general it's going to be the average loss for a bunch of pairs x, you know, xj and yj, right? And we want to find the set of parameters, so deep learning itself, is just setting up this problem, having your data, and then an optimization algorithm to efficiently minimize, the, uh, minimize this loss function subject to variations of the parameters phi, right? So that sounds a lot, very similar to these variational algorithms uh, or quantum parametric circuits, also called like uh, 
yeah, there's, there's various names. Some people call them quantum neural networks. Uh, but that's, you know, that's ruining the punch. But uh, the point is that people have been using these in the past few years now, and uh, their connection to classical deep learning has not been you know, fully fleshed out. Well, so let's compare. So we have a bunch of classical parameters of our circuit, which is a bunch of transformations like this little rotations, one and two qubit rotations. Sometimes, sometimes more complicated uh, transformations. We have, let's say, a, an input C naught, and depending on our choice of parameters, we'll have a certain output that depends on these parameters. So now my feedforward operation is a parametric unitary, which is you know the composition of all these little transformations, similar to above. And uh, our goal will be to minimize. Uh, I'm going to quant. I'm going to have my loss. So my loss has to be a real value, right? So. How do I get a real value out of a quantum computer? Well, I could, get, I could look at an, uh, an expectation value of an observable. So if I define an operator for my desired output that you know, quantify, its eigenvalue quantifies how well we're doing, uh, then my goal will be to minimize uh, the expectation value of this operator subjects to variations of the parameters. So if you're doing the variational quantum eigensolver, you could phrase it as a problem like this. Uh, and actually, you could phrase a whole lot of problems in this way. And we do so in, in the paper. Um, uh, namely, you could phrase possibly classical deep learning as a kind of quantum parametric circuit optimization problem, right? How, how would we do that? And that's, that's what I'll answer today. And I'll, I'll talk about how to optimize quantum parametric circuits. So what can be phrased as quantum parametric circuit? So in, in this paper, we talk about how to, in a sense, quantize feed-forward neural networks. In a previous paper from December, uh, well, with one of my co-authors, we, uh, we, we showed how to convert Boltzmann machine training, which is a completely different than feed-forward type of neural network, how to train it using quantum parametric circuits. Right? Um, so, so in a sense, if we uh, put everything under the same roof, and then we have a strategy to optimize uh, parametric circuits, then you know, we have one optimizer to rule them all. So, so then how do we efficiently optimize quantum parametric circuits? Right, so the current paradigm that's really successful, it's been really successful for the you know, near-term era where we have noisy operations and we, we can't do many, many quantum operations before the party's over. Um, so the current paradigm is to have these parametric circuits and then to have quantum classical hybrid optimization. So that would mean you have a classical processing unit that feeds your current guess of the parameters to the quantum processing unit. And then the quantum processing unit feeds the, it could ex execute multiple runs, doing you know, just the feed forward and an expectation value of the loss uh, many times. It gives you an expectation value of the loss for the current set of the parameters, right, for this state. Um, and, and so the, the classical processing unit just gets you know, a loss, a classical, you know, it's a, it's a real number, and it, it, it gave the QPU a, a, a big vector. So to the CPU, it just sees the QPU as a black box that I feed a vector, it tells me how well I'm doing, and then I could, I could work with that. So I could do finite difference gradient, I could do uh, the finite difference gradient descent, I could do Nelder mead there's all sorts of uh, black box optimizers for uh, classical computing. But the point is that, you know, what's, okay, so that, that's, that works really well for noisy intermediate scale devices and for the near term era, but, you know, we'd like to have one theory of everything's quantum and, you know, just quantize all the things, right? That's what physicists do. They just put hats on things, right? So what in the near term, how are we going to leverage quantum properties to accelerate this optimization, right? How, so we're using classical computers for optimization of quantum circuits. If we're already using quantum circuits, why not also have the optimization be quantum, right? So let's try to phrase it such that, phrase our problem such that we have, uh, we can have superpositions of parameters, right? And this is a vector of real numbers. We're gonna figure out how to encode that on a quantum computer. But then I could have a wave function over my possible parameters. And then in each branch of the wave function, when I apply my circuit, I get a, you know, an entangled superposition of having a different parameter and then applying a different parametric circuit. So how could I do this and then how can I leverage that to perform a fully quantum optimization of kind of these quantum neural network-like 
uh, parametric circuits. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to treat today. So the trick is, given a circuit that you know the, the, classical, the classically parametrized version, there's a way to upgrade it in a sense. So what you do is you convert your parametric operations to be quantum parametric operations. So in a sense, it's like converting an X gate to control the X gate. That would be a very simple version. But now the, the, the control is, uh, is, a, is a real number. It has to be a, a, a register that holds a real number. So how, that's not something we, t it's something we talk about in classical computing, you know, floats and whatnot, you know, 16-bit uh, precision registers for real numbers, but we don't talk about that in quantum computing as much. What we know about is phase estimation, and we have some intuition. We have, you know, Fourier transforms and all these things, so how can we have a, a real number on a kind of a digital uh, quantum computer or made of qubits like uh, Rigetti's, right? How are we going to do this? How are we going to upgrade our, our gates to be quantum parametric? Uh, this is just a notation that, you know, all of these gates make a, a big, complicated, uh, controlled unitary where each, uh, each operation has a, a quantum register that stores the real number value. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about quantum, you know, something that, uh, an observable that would have a real number kind of spectrum, nice smooth spectrum? Well. You know, when we're talking about continuous variable quantum systems, we're talking about, you know, uh, modes, Q modes, right? Like, you know, a resonator or a, harmonic, a quantum harmonic oscillator. So if you're a physicist, you've learned everything about this. But the reality is that you can simulate having a continuous variable object on a digital quantum computer using log logarithmically many qubits for the range that you want. Um, so a, a discrete variable quantum computer can approximate a or a, a continuous variable object with exponential precision uh, via this conversion. So uh, what you do is, so if phi is position and pi is what we consider to be momentum, right? In quantum mechanics, the momentum is the canonical conjugate to, uh, to position. It just means it's the Fourier, it's, it, it, to go from one to the other, it's a Fourier transform. So here the Fourier transform would be like a 90 degree rotation. So the point is that uh, you can encode position in kind of a binary form, right? If I, if I have a bunch of qubits and I scale the, the gaps of each qubit by a factor of two each time, then if I look at the joint spectrum, it's, it's going to have, you know, if I look at the readout of like all my qubits, are, if they're zero or one, then I could use that and consider that as kind of a, a, a real value readout, right? I can encode. Uh, a real value into a bunch of uh, bits classically. So I do that with the standard basis of my qubits. So if I encode a position, right, in these kind of exponentially scaled, uh, you know, zero, is it the zero or one of each uh, qubit, uh, then how would I get the momentum? Well, it's the good old quantum Fourier transform. So if we apply the quantum Fourier transform to this, uh, this kind of position operator, and here it's a very general formula that you know, any interval, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, the real numbers that you want, you could approximate it like this, uh, then you just convert from position to momentum via the, Fourier, the quantum Fourier transform, which is really efficient to do on a quantum computer, right? Uh, in some cases, if you have a, a, an analog Q mode like this, a Fourier transform is very natural. It's just get a Fourier transform from its natural dynamics. If it's on a digital computer, there's a very efficient gate synthesis for this. So I'm going to talk about position and momentum and continuous variable uh, kind of degrees of freedom, but keep in mind that you know you can have arbitrary precision. You could tune it to you know like a few qubits. I think we use like three qubits for our numerics uh, per parameter. So you, you know you could tune it to your liking. Later on, maybe someday we'll have 16, 32-bit uh, precision for this. But for now, we keep you know we're probably going to use like one or, or two or three qubits at a time uh, to simulate the Q mode. So, so to give you an intuition of phase space, which is this position momentum kind of, I, I'm plotting kind of a pseudo probability distribution over position and momentum. It's like the Wigner function, if you're familiar. Um, so, so just quantum mechanics 101 again. Uh, what are what does it look like in phase space when I apply various operators that are exponentials of these observables? You know, phi and pi, right? Um, well, if I exponentiate momentum, momentum, right, 
generates shifts in position, right? So the position is horizontal, so I generate a shift. So it's like a flow. It's like a wind that takes this state, and each piece is going to, you know, get shifted according to the, you know, the vector field that's uh, local there. Okay, so what would pi squared look like? Well, pi squared would be, depending on my value of momentum, which is vertical, I'll shift you more, you know, forward or backwards, depending if you're negative, right? So it's going to look like this. It's going to be greater and greater. It's going to be parabolic in amplitude. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, so similarly, just like we said, if you rotate 90 degrees, you get to position. So similarly, a shift in position or an exponential of position generates a shift in momentum, right? And that's actually the basis for phase estimation. We'll get to that. Um, that's a very common algorithm in quantum computing, if you're familiar. So, okay, so what if I do phi squared? Well, it's similar. It's just a 90 degree rotated picture. And for those of you that know this Hamiltonian, which is the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, uh, if you combine the flows of both operators, it becomes kind of, you know, you go here, and then you go down, and then you go here, and you go up. So then it becomes kind of a circular flow, right? And that's the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, which is going to, you know, this describes kind of an oscillation and a parabolic potential. All right, okay, so this is just like phase space intuition. But that's all, we, that's all we need to figure out all of quantum deep learning, actually. So, uh, so deep learning, a uh, very common optimizer that people use in classical deep learning is gradient descent, right? You're trying to take a gradient of the loss function and go down, down the hill, right? Uh, you know, the gradient is the notion of what is the direction that is uh, the steepest descent. So what if we pulsed uh, an exponential of position? What it would look... Uh, 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 sorry, exponential of a function of the position operator. It could be a polynomial, let's say, right? So what would that look like? So let's say this is my function of phi, and then if, if I take the derivative or the, the gradient in high dimensions, it looks like this. So now if I look at my flow, uh, my flow here, uh, the uh, direction and magnitude is going to be controlled by this, uh, this, uh, this value of the gradient, right? So I'm generating shifts in the momentum according to the gradient. So if I have an exponential like this and I look at the Heisenberg picture of how my operators get shifted around, you know, it's another way to look at how things get transformed. Instead of looking at how states get transformed, you look at how operators get transformed. The point is that momentum got shifted by a value proportional to the negative gradient. So I've kicked, I've kicked my variable, right? A kick would mean I change the momentum, and then if I had like you know kinetic energy, then it would start flying off, right? If it's a soccer ball or something, right? From classical mechanics. So that's something we're going to use actually, uh, simulated kind of kinetics, right? To optimize over the space of quantum neural nets or quantum parametric circuits. So this is a little aside, just because uh, a lot of people learn about phase estimation in their you know quantum computing. 102 or something, uh, and they don't have an intuition for how it works. It's just like a magic. There's a whole bunch of phases everywhere, and, and then it suddenly works, right? So the intuition is that if you look at it from a continuous variable standpoint, uh, I can have kind of a squeezed state, which is, well, literally squeezed like this. It's a Gaussian that's very, that's very thin. So let's say, uh, so phase estimation is just kind of like addition. Depending on the, a certain variable here, I'm going to apply a linear shift that depends on the value of this variable, right? So you could replace phi one here by an observable, a general observable, and then this is the phase estimation algorithm, right? So, so what happens here is that uh, I'll, I'll shift, let's say I'm, I'm trying to add this guy's position, which is the observable, uh, to, to this guy. This is my pointer state. Well, I apply you know, the Fourier transform, which is a, uh, uh, or inverse Fourier transform, 90 degree rotation. I do a, fa a phase shift depending on this guy's position, and then I undo the, the rotation, and I get this, right? So now, what is it? One plus two equals three. All right, great school. Yay, we did it. All right, addition, <laughs> using a whole lot of Hilbert space. Um, but, okay, so, so that's continuous variables, but really, we just described a way to uh, simulate continuous variables with a bunch of discrete variables. So what if I had a pointer state, if I had you know, a, a bunch of qubits that form kind of a 64-dimensional uh, uh, qdit here, uh, what if I phase estimated a position, then I would generate a shift this way by this position, this much, and then this is an actual you know, full numerical calculation of phase estimation. Looks funky, but you know, basically you'll always measure the, the right position uh, here. So it's just readout, right? So in a sense, 
phase estimation is just applying a linear shift depending on my observed eigenvalue, right? So then getting a quantum gradient is just kind of phase, it's like phase estimation. Everything in quantum computing more or less is based on uh, phase kickback, or at least a whole ton of algorithms. So just like phase estimation, gradient uh, estimation is based on phase kickback. But instead of having to have a very sharp pointer state here and having to measure and getting statistics to estimate the gradient and then passing it back to my classical computer, a thing we'll do is just let it slide. Just give it a kick and let it rip, as we say in Canadian, right? Uh, okay, so, so how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna induce a phase shift, right, of all our, our, our quantum parameters uh, according to our loss function, because that's what we want to minimize, right? So we could, what we could use is phase kickback like this, right? So, because we'll have these kind of quantum controlled parameters. So, uh, so what, what you do is you have this uh, quantum parameterized unitary, you have a superposition of parameters, right? This is like a superposition of the space of quantum neural nets. And then in each case, you apply a different parametric unitary. There's a way to synthesize this, this big gate. And this would be just uh, our computer, our compute register, remember, where you apply the parametric unitary. This is just like our, our, our register for our parameters. So if you apply the unitary of feed forward, you apply a phase kick according to the loss function. So what I'm doing is, depending on the loss function, I'm, I'm kicking your momentum accordingly. Right? So if, you're, if you have a large eigenvalue of the loss function, then you, you made a big mistake, so I'm gonna punish you for it. Right? I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kick very hard. Uh, so so for the, you know, just like um, in, you know, you've probably seen, uh, if I apply, if I have a C naught uh, and I apply uh, a poly Z and then I, I apply another C naught, you know, if you're doing quantum error correction, the, the poly Z error creeps up the control, right? So this is kind of the same principle. It's just phase kickback. So in this case, phase kickback would be like a multivariate continuous variable phase kickback, right? Uh, but this is, you know, this circuit is just a fancy version of, of this. It's the same principle. It's kind of, uh, yes, uh, okay. So, so the point is, if I apply a kick at my output uh, and, and then I uncompute for my phase kickback to creep back up, then effectively, what, I, what I've applied is a shift of the momentum that's nonlinear, right, and, and of all my parameters, right? And you could do the algebra on this and up to second order in eta, which is, you know, this constant of how much you're kicking, uh, you get uh, a phase that is, you know, the expectation value of how your output did, right? It was the expectation value of the loss operator that we wanted to minimize. Okay, so we just did what we wanted. We, we, ha we have a phase kick according to our loss function, and over here we know that if we kick according to a function of, of a continuous parameter, I'll have shifted the momentum according to the gradient. So now we'll have two ways to use this, right? Uh, but before I talk about this, I was talking about one data point. So what you can have is you can have pairs of loss functions and, and inputs, a very general formalism. You could do all sorts of stuff. We'll get to that in a second. But uh, what you could do is you could sequentially stack these kicks, right? You could like, it's like if time was frozen, I was accumulating punches and then I let, I let time evolve and then suddenly my ball is, is flying in the right direction, right? So uh, in the paper, we talk about how to do this in parallel, in quantum parallel, in classical par parallel, and in sequence. Uh, but the point is usually you talk about batching your data in classical machine learning and it's really important to be able to parallelize over batches. So we treated that fully in the paper. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later uh, in, in some detail. But the point is that if you batch a bunch of phase kicks, which were these script L loss functions, uh, let's say I, I batch over my whole data set just for convenience so we always have the same kind of, of kick every time, then I'll have, uh, let's say I define my cost function to the, be the average loss over my whole batch, then I could stack these kicks and get a, a phase kick according to my full batch cost function, okay? Uh, so, uh, so what, how are we going to use this, right? Like, well, so we just induce a phase kick according to a certain function of kind of the position, right, in multi-dimensional, you know, continuous variable space. Well, if you remember Schrodinger mechanics 
from you know, basic quantum mechanics, uh, the Schrodinger equation or, or, or the Hamiltonian uh, that, that describes the evolution in the Schrodinger equation uh, is usually of the form uh, momentum squared and a potential, which depends on the position, right? So then if I simulated dynamics with a kind of a time-dependent potential that I can tune, uh, then, like I said, if I, sh if I induce a force on my parameters now, we could use the force by adding a kinetic term. So by simulating kind of a very coarse grain time evolution, alternating between my phase kicks and then my kinetic term uh, exponentials, then suddenly I'm, I'm stepping down the hill, right? And uh, by tuning the mass, well, uh, actually, do I talk about this here? Yeah, so, so by tuning the mass in, the time, in this kind of time-dependent simulation, uh, there's ways to hit kind of the adiabatic limit. If you're close to, you know, a, a, uh, a local minimum that I could Taylor expand as a second order thing, uh, then I, you know, I could tune my mass over time to kind of stick the landing, right? Because if I just give it a kick and, and, and let go, then it's just going to swing through the minimum. But what I can do is the intuition is I would start with a small mass, I would kick it with a certain force, so it starts to go flying, right? But you know in machine learning you want to tune the learning rates as you go. So what you do is you start with a small mass and then you simulate increasing the mass, right, by tuning what I'm kicking for this kinetic term. So if I start with a small mass and then suddenly I have a big mass, by conservation of momentum I'm going to slow down. It's just going to be the same momentum but now it's for a uh, a much larger mass, so it's going to be a much smaller velocity. And that works. And that analogy you could connect it to the adiabatic theorem and show, show this converges. So we call this, sorry, we call this method quantum dynamical descent. And for those who are familiar with it, there's a type of, of quantum algorithm for classical optimization, because this is classical optimization of parameters. Well, it's a quantum way to do classical optimization. Uh, there's a certain class of algorithms called quantum, uh, uh, quantum alternating operator ansatz. So, so they're always alternating operators that, you know, you have a, an exponential of an operator that everything commutes, and then you have something that doesn't commute. You have a, you know, a potential that you want to kind of optimize and a driver that mixes things, right? So this quantum dynamical descent is a form of QAOA to optimize neural nets, right? So, uh, so let's look at how, how this works. Let, look, let's look at a circuit. So just for notation, where do I even, even begin? What is a, a good initial state for my parameters? Well, I could create a, a Gaussian state, let's say, because it has some nice mathematical properties for analysis. Uh, I could create a Gaussian state easily in analog Q modes, and it, there's algorithms for that in the discrete Q modes. Uh, but the point is I have an initial position and an initial momentum. And then I also have an initial uncertainty in position versus momentum. And I could have trade-offs between both. That's an interesting thing. Uh, because we're using quantum uncertainty to, to fuzz where we are and where we're going, right? Uh, so uh, so these are all these parameters, we call them the initialization hyperparameters, which are theta. Okay, big complicated diagram here. All right, let's, let's break it down. So, uh, so this is the quantum dynamical descent algorithm. You have your preparation unitary at the beginning. You prepare this Gaussian state that depends on your hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are kind of like parameters that you assumed were true, like your architecture of your neural network. You know, any, yeah, basically anything you assume that's you know a certain cert, uh, parameterized a certain way uh, that you assume, and then you do your optimization with that assumption. Like, okay, maybe this is the best architecture for my neural net and then I optimize it. Oh, maybe that, that was a bad assumption. So what happens is that you often have to do hyperparameter optimization when you're doing machine learning. And later on, as you'll see, well, the reason I keep all these hyperparameters around is because we're going to quantumly optimize those hyperparameters in a second. It's quantum all the way down. Um, but uh, OK, so this is the quantum dynamical descent algorithm. You prepare the state. You apply this kind of phase kick, you know, compute, phase kick, uncompute many times. You apply the Fourier transform, uh, and then you apply phi squared because when you conjugate with a Fourier transform, it becomes momentum squared. And then you alternate doing this, right? And you, you keep going, right? So that's, that's the quantum dynamical descent. This is the parameter register, compute. And this is classical data, right? Like the loss function, the desired output would depend on classical or quantum data. So you could have a data register. It's, it's kind of a general formalism. We have hyperparameters, which we call the rate hyperparameters. 
which are just how much you're kicking in you know, momentum or, or kinetic term. Um, so you know, in the near term, we know we can't do super long algorithms. Right? So at some point, we want a version that we could just measure and checkpoint classically, like keep in classical memory where we are and where we're going. Right? So what you could do is, because as I said, with the phase kicks, you generate a shift in momentum according to the gradient. Well, by repeating the circuit a couple times, you could get an estimate on the gradient in the landscape in a quantum fashion. And this shows a speed up as compared to a finite difference kind of black box, kind of a finite difference gradient, because uh, uh, you know, that's, that's slow. You just got to try, you know, if you have n parameters, usually you have to try n expectation values for n different parameters to get an estimate of the gradient, whereas this is order one, so single shot roughly. Um, and then you could, you know, you can have an update rule where you update your parameters according to your shifted momentum, and then you can simulate conservation of momentum, and it becomes gradient descent with momentum, which is a technique used in classical machine learning. So it's nice that we're taking our classical intuition and we're quantizing it everything, right? Uh, so, okay, so, so that's momentum measurement gradient descent. Previously, that was quantum dynamical descent. So here's a phase space picture, just a cartoon, of comparing both techniques. So let's say I have a phase kick according to a cubic kind of function, right? So then my gradient is gonna be a quadratic function. That's why you get like the Star Trek symbol. Uh, so if I shift the momentum according to a quadratic function, then it's gonna look like this, right? Once I've, I've kicked it. Uh, and then what I do is I measure the shift in momentum and then shift position, you can see it's shifted slightly, uh, according to this gradient, right? And I keep doing this, on, uh, I iterate like this. Quantum dynamical descent, on the other hand, is gonna keep everything coherent, right? So it's gonna be a wave function where each piece of the wave function just goes down its local slope. So each possibility feels a different value of the force, right? Uh, so then that allows for tunneling in, in, in the space of optimization. And we're hoping that you know, it allows for speed ups in certain cases where the landscape is very difficult. So there's a whole theory of adiabatic algorithms and optimization algorithms from you know, annealing, but now you could apply it to feed forward neural nets. And uh, it's the same kind of uh, theory. Uh, so we're, you know, we haven't proven any speed ups per se of using this, but uh, the fact that everything's coherent, it's actual real Schrodinger dynamics in high dimensional spaces, so you'll get tunneling, uh, then we hope that uh, this allows for more powerful optimization. In general, people are hinting towards the fact that QAOA seems to have a square root speed up over classical optimizers, but I don't know if that's been formally, formally proven yet, but that's what the insiders uh, in the industry think right now. Uh, okay, so I talked about this. Okay, so we know how, we know how to port, uh, well, we haven't seen that yet, but. Theoretically, if we could port classical neural nets to uh, quantum parametric circuits, uh, and then we could optimize them there, then everything's great. But I didn't say what you could do with quantum parametric circuits. It was very abstract, right? That was just for the optimization section. So what can you do with quantum parametric circuits? You know, how do you machine learn quantum data with this? Well, there's a few things you could do. You know, there's a couple apps, uh, you know, no big deal. But these are the ones that we covered in the paper in uh, full detail. Um, Actually, I can, there was more, but I can fit in the slide. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I'll go through some of them that are more near term. But the point is that, you know, as, as long as you have a way to plug in your data and a way to induce a, a shift in the momentum, right, an exponential of the observable's eigenvalue that you want to optimize, then you're good. And there's, there's crazy ways to use, like, copies of states to induce, like, uh, a loss function that's induced by inner product, but that's kind of later, you know, that's probably for long-term quantum computing. Uh, but the point is that you could learn states, you could learn mixed states, you know, the circuit decomposition of mixed states, like in the dilated picture. Uh, you could learn unitaries, channels, so on and so forth. Uh, one that is of particular interest is, you know, learning a quantum to classical map. So how to classify quantum states or how to have a continuous label for classification, which is basically regression, or how to learn a measurement in general. It's all the same class, it's all the same problem. There's also quantum autoencoders. Whether you want to compress data or you want to denoise data, there's ways to use autoencoders. There's something in, in well, we'll get to the, the generative adversarial circuits, but that's uh, a quantum analog of generative adversarial networks from uh, classical machine learning. 
Uh, parametric Hamiltonian optimization uh, is, includes all these chemistry algorithms and these optimization algorithms and QAOA itself. So using that, we're going to be able to do meta-learning. Uh, but we'll get to that. And we'll, there's a way to pr plug uh, a quantum neural network to its output to a classical neural network and have this kind of back propagation of errors all the way through. Right, I didn't mention why it's, we, we call it backpropagation, uh, but the point is that as you uncompute uh, this big unitary, right, uh, it's, uh, it's made up of a bunch of tiny transformations, so as you uncompute, you get phase kickback in each register one at a time. So in a sense, it's a phase error, because it's phase shifts, and as you uncompute, you get you get kind of kicked one at a time as you uncompute. So you can kind of trace back the, the signal for the quantum loss function that's propagating through the circuit through kind of looking at the algebra of how things get nudged. And, and we do that in crazy detail in the paper, but that's important if we're gonna design better quantum parametric circuits that don't have problems uh, with their, their uh, gradient signals, uh, which is a big problem right now. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so let's look at some of these examples. So quantum classification. Well, a general measurement, I'll use an ancilla, I'll have a state, I'll apply a unitary, and then I'll, I'll, I'll measure, right? And, you know, if I have classification according to, you know, one, I have multiple qubits, right? And each qubit, depending if it's, if it's one, then it's that state, right? It's a unit, let's say I have unitary encoding, uh, then I could classify very simply Right? If, I, if I'm doing a unitary encoding, that means um, I have multiple qubits and there's only one qubit at a time that is on or hot and, and each possible on state is a different class. Right? So then what I can do is have a loss function that's very simple and there's ways to do this in the near term. But in general, you can have a, a you know, mean square loss, you can have all sorts of functions. Uh, but it's, it's, it looks simple in our abstracted out formalism. Uh, but the point is you plug in a certain label value and then you have a loss function that depends on this label, right? Uh, and uh, we, show, we show how to use this uh, numerically in the paper a bit later. Um, so quantum Hamiltonian optimization is another application that's relevant for the near term. That's when you want to prepare a state that is of low eigenvalue of a certain Hamiltonian, right? I want to approximately find the ground state or, or yeah, uh, in general, it could be a non-commuting Hamiltonian, right? So you could have multiple terms that don't commute, in which case there's ways to paralyze, uh, paralyze your, your gradient accumulation, right? So this would be, uh, you could, for each term of the Hamiltonian, you could compute the gradient of the, you know, you could split this up like if it was a batch, your Hamiltonian each term becomes like a batch term, and, and then you could add up the contributions to the gradient of each term and then do gradient descent on the total. And then you could find a ground state of a non-commuting Hamiltonian, which would be difficult. Uh, there's ways to quantumly pr uh, parallelize this using kind of a GHZ entanglement. Uh, so in a sense, you're, you're, yeah, you create GHZ entanglement uh, using kind of a multi-target adder here. Uh, you apply the phase kicks and you know, if I have a superposition that's entangled in, in, in GHZ, you know, let's say I had, you know, uh, 0, 0, 0, uh, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, so on. Uh, and then I apply a relative phase shift uh, like this, uh, but in, in each copy, then if I have uh, n copies, then I'll have a factor of n here. And then I, as I uncompute uh, this GHZ, I'll, I'll get kind of a phase kick in, in one register tensored with a bunch of zeros, right? So if I had, uh, yeah, if I had zero, zero, uh, yeah. Anyways, I, cr I, create, I create the GHZ state, I apply a phase kick, then I uncompute it. This is a trick in quantum sensing, but we use this to parallelize uh, data for quantum deep learning, right? It's kind of, it's kind of nuts. So I invite you to check out the paper. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm almost there. Uh, generative adversarial networks, um, this is a way to have uh, two networks that kind of battle to, like one, one uh, network is trying to fool the discriminator, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's trying, so okay. So the discriminator gives you a label of, I think this input was tr uh, true or false. Was it from the real data set or the fake data set, right? 
and the uh, generator is trying to generate uh, inputs for the discriminator network that fool it, right? And uh, using this, actually, I won't, I won't have time to go into the details, but uh, using this and a way to flip the gradient signal, uh, basically, you could train a discriminator and generator all at once. And what this allows you to do is create states, find ways to generate a circuit that, uh, you know, let, let's say, classically, I'd have pictures of bedrooms. How do I define the problem of uh, a, having a good picture of a bedroom? How do I quantify my loss function for, oh, this is bedroomy. Oh, no, that's not very bedroomy. And it's got to be continuous, right? Well, I use a different neural network for that. So in the same vein, I use a parametric circuit to give you, to convert from, you know, a binary loss function to kind of a, any loss function on the input. And the, the loss function is going to get converted from binary to, like, whatever this format of input is, and it's going to route to the generator. And then the generator is going to do gradient ascent on this loss function instead of descent. And in a sense, you could uh, generate states that uh, mimic a sample from a certain data distribution. OK, we're almost, uh, we're almost done. Uh, so this is how to merge quantum and classical deep learning, right, seamlessly. Merge our backprop with the original Hinton style backpropagation. Well, what you do is you have a quantum classifier that has kind of a vector of observables. You feed the expectation value to, as an input to the neural network. You feed forward. You backpropagate the gradient in classically. And then you feed that gradient as a linear phase shift, right? Uh, and that linear phase shift is going to induce a shift in momentum depending on this value of the backpropagated gradient. And we showed that this works really well. How do we get this? Well, we converted uh, uh, feed-forward neural networks to quantum circuits. I invite you to check out the paper uh, to, to know more about how we did that. Uh, there's ways to do ReLU and whatnot and all sorts of, of cool, cool activation functions. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in the paper, including like meta-learning, which is where <laughs> the optimizer optimizes itself, and parallelization and swarms and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, let's just blast through some numerics uh, just to show you it works. It's not just my, my crazy thoughts. Um, so this is, you know, this neural network learning an XOR function using a circuit we converted uh, quantumly, right? Tunneling in the space of neural networks, right? So quantum dynamical descent, it learns, it minimizes the loss function to learn the XOR function, which is, you know, zero when you have zero, zero, or zero when you have uh, one, one. Um, and it works also with momentum measurement gradient descent. And these are the decision boundaries. You could learn unitaries. Uh, we'll go into that. You can uh, optimize QAOA, which is this optimization algorithm. This is applied to a max cut problem. Uh, so the point is that, you know, since our optimization algorithm itself is a QAOA problem, here we show you could optimize QAOA. So it's, it's kind of like you can optimize itself uh, forever. Um, but yeah, this is. Uh, so this is learning, let's say I prepare an eigenstate of momentum, right, as an input. Now I have a hybrid neural network trying to learn, the circuit has to learn the Fourier transform, and the uh, neural net that's connected to its output has to combine the readouts of the different bits to give the correct eigenvalue. So it's got to learn, both have to learn uh, uh, jointly uh, how to optimize the loss function, which is the mean square loss. So I'm trying to decode the eigenvalue of a state. Right? And I just give you the eigenvalue. I don't tell you what the observable is. I gives you, give you a parametric circuit connected to a neural net. Then both have to talk to each other. They got to optimize jointly. So with hybrid backprop between classical neural nets and this quantum circuit, we could optimize both together. And as you can see, you learn really well the eigenvalue. So the point is, uh, we have a formalism now to, for all of classical deep learning as quantum deep learning and we have quantum ways to optimize quantum deep learning, and we have classical ways to optimize quantum deep learning. So the theory of quantum deep learning is expanding. It's great. Now that we have the backprop, now we can move on to specific onsets, right? What are good circuits? What are these good parametric transformations such that I get, I get uh, cool applications that work, right? Classically, we have convolutional nets. We have all sorts of networks. We need the equivalent for quantum uh, deep learning. Uh, another thing I'm exploring personally is how can quantum deep learning influence classical deep learning? We have an interesting mechanism here of how, how through dynamics, weights can optimize themselves. So that's something I'm, I'm exploring. Uh, can you have a model where, just from the physics, the system learns 
you know, I mean, our brain's not quantum. I'm not going to say that. Uh, but if you have a quantum model, then uh, maybe you can convert it later to kind of a classical stochastic uh, model. So that's something I'm looking on. But, uh, you know, it's a very nascent field. Uh, six months ago, it didn't exist, more or less. And uh, <laughs> uh, now I have two papers in it. And uh, things are moving very fast. So if you're looking to do any work in quantum deep learning and you're around IQC, I'm always looking for collaborators. And come talk to me. Cool. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, Sabir. Where exactly is the speed up? Yeah, so if you're, if you're doing quantum parametric circuits, if you're doing like Nelder meet or finite difference uh, gradient descent, if you have n parameters, you need to get n expectation values for each iteration. If you're doing the gradient descent, like the momentum measurement gradient descent, then it's order one uh, expectation values per update. Right? So it's much faster like, uh, as you have a large network with a lot of parameters. Uh, in terms of quantum dynamical descent, because we connected it to the whole theory of adiabatic optimization and whatnot, uh, we didn't formally prove a speed up because it's kind of a moving target, right? We don't even have one application, we have about 50 in the paper, right? So there's various cost functions, there's various scenarios. But yeah, we're, we're looking into you know, fixing a certain scenario where we could potentially show a speed up for the optimization. But in well, okay, so it's actually, it's not adiabatic, it's QAOA, which is uh, kind of a near-term version of quantum adiabatic optimization, but yeah, okay, so that's the, so uh, Eddie Farr, he invented this, uh, it's called the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, uh, and it's when you have alternating operators. It's basically like a trotterized simulation of adiabatic evolution, but with very coarse grain kind of operators, like big blocks. Um, it, well, people are trying to prove things about QAOA. It's an active field of research. Yeah, I mean, um, but the point is that if your optimization is coherent, then you could do meta-optimization. You can, and hyperparameter, so optimizing hyperparameters in classical neural nets is really hard. People just do a grid search, right? They just try a bunch. Or they do grad student descent. They have their grad student try a bunch of them. So then that's really inefficient, right? But here you can optimize, you could get gradients on the hyperparameters really efficiently, right? So you could have superpositions of different architectures of neural networks, and then you could, in each branch of the superposition, have an optimization and then see what the loss function was, what the performance was when it was trained. Uh, yeah, there's no, we haven't formally proved a speed up yet, but you know, it's, we're proposing another heuristic. Uh, and uh, I think for near-term optimization, if you can implement this, it, it would be useful. Uh, people would see a, a big difference on the wall clock time um, because ha getting many, many expectation values when you have a certain block of time on a QPU, uh, you know, that, that's difficult. So if we could cut that by, you know, let's say you have 20 parameters by a factor of 20, you have a factor of 20 speed up, then that's valuable. <clears throat> 